want to welcome you here today. Next year will be our 40th year, actually in the fall of 2012. And we hope that you will continue to be guests of our series. So I'm going to introduce now Bernie Koenig, who is a musician and a faculty member here, and he's going to introduce James. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Can you hear me? Do I need the mic? Uh, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he's the guy you will call oh. later. Yeah. Am I okay? Okay. Um, it's always fun to introduce somebody that you know outside of this place, and we do know each other for a number of years now. And I, when he came, I said, I have to introduce him. Uh, as you've heard already, he's part of a literary family. His parents are well known. There's some of his books there for sale afterwards. You do that. Uh, James, some of the people that, you, that we know who are older than we are call you Junior, as you know that. They still do. <coughs> because of James Rainey Sr. and Jr. Um, he's been all kinds of things with the free press. He covered sports, he covered amateur baseball during spring training, uh, major base baseball during spring training. He's been the arts and entertainment reporter for the free press for a long time, covers all the concerts at the Labatt Center. Uh, his connection to Fanshawe is very interesting because he's involved with the Jack Richardson Awards program. He's on the steering committee of that. So hopefully we have some MIA people here who have that connection as well. And so uh, why don't I just shut up and turn it over to James Rainey. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie, and thanks, Ingrid. It's, uh, I'm a little bit more high tech than I usually am, but, but um, I would like to say that what you're about to hear is entirely unofficial. I am an entertainment reporter and columnist for the London Free Press. I keep a blog at lfpress.com and I have a Twitter account and an lfpress.com friendly Facebook page. I also host two videos a week. One is called It's On, and it's an effort to use some video of about four performers and talk in about 90 seconds as to what you might see uh, worthwhile checking out in London. So if you're, if you're a performer, let us know about that. Um, the other one, and this again, if you're a musician or a Perform of any kind, I'd really appreciate hearing about this as well, is uh, called Rainey's Pick, and it's a one-take, lo-fi, live off-the-floor performance by a local performer. Our sales pitch is pretty simple, I'll give it to you here. We don't have any money, but we have a lot of fun. The Rainey's Pick team likes to boast that we've gone all the way from A to B. A being the great pop punk women from the London band The Alcoholics, and B being the great Canadian opera singer, Ben Hepner. I should add, we go all the way from A to B to C, because if I can play this properly, you'll see my late mother, Colleen Thibodeau Rainey, in one that, uh, it's, this is obviously my all-time favorite, Rainey's Pick, and we've had great, we've had great people, both artists, both national artists, uh, uh, but, and, and London performers, but this has to be my favorite, so we'll see if I can figure out how to play this on the, uh, on the screen here. Yep, we're going to go full screen and now we're going to... And this shows a little bit of how it's, life for me as a journalist has changed in the years I've worked at the Free Press. Hi, this is James Rainey with this week's edition of Rainey's Pick in London Arts and Entertainment. And it's not this week, it's this month, it's this year. Because there's one place I know I have to be on September 30th at 7.30, and that's at the Landon branch, where my mom, London's greatest poet, Colleen Thibodeau, is reading as part of a Poetry London evening, Mom, I Love You. Take it away, Mom. You're reading now. Oh, good gracious. People are funny these days. Mary and Friends Court Martial. Now, anyone who went to Mission Band in the United Church can visualize exactly this picture that was on our little Sunday school Mission Band paper. When we were children, we all danced and held hands around the world. These meadows once were green and stretched where a blue river curled. A river once was blue. Korean saints held up their hands in thanks. You have caught on by now this is the Korean War. My brother was in the Air Force at that time. That season river ice was crossable and pure white snow lay on the 
thanks. And only that tenant of the bad dude, full of Christmas spirit, crossed no man's land, crouched with the enemy underground, who smiled and sang and held his hand. When we were children, we all danced and held hands around the world. These meadows once were meadows, stretching where a blue river curls. You are now London's top poet, London's oh. greatest poet. <laughs> Mum, I love you. You will be reading at the Landon Branch on September 30th, 7.30. And remember, you can get all your London arts and entertainment information, Mum, in ticket every Thursday in the free press. And of course, if you choose to, 24-7 at lfpress.com. This is James Rainey signing off, blowing a kiss to his mother. Thank you, James. I'll return to you. So anyway, if you, when I started out with the Free Press in 1979, if you told me that 30 years later I'd be making a video with my mother as the guest, well, she's the star, and I'm, I'm just lucky enough to be on the screen with her. But I would not, I would have just, I had no training for that, but that's the kind of thing we're expected to do. And I, I'm not saying I'm getting any better at it, but, there, but every week we, we do something like that. Uh, the bands come in and play unplugged. We have uh, folk performers, we've done some jazz, we've done classics. So if you're interested, come up and see me afterwards. Or if you've got somebody you think would be interested, we'd love to uh, have a run at it with you. Of course, for me, that, there are a whole bunch of reasons that's my all-time favorite, one, aside from the fact it's my mother. But it catches her late, a few years ago. Her health is still pretty good. Um, the poem is, is a fascinating one about, it's a, fr a friend of hers from St. Thomas who I think got drunk. And during the Korean War, had this vision that if he crossed the lines, he could make friends with the North Koreans, but it's quite tragic, of course, because he was treated as a traitor, and it took a long time to get to get them back together and get sorted out. But it, it has a for me, it has. I mean, there are all kinds of things. The paintings you see in the background are my father's paintings, so it's a very rich three or four minutes. Aside from the fact that it's me and my mom, which of course I'm going to be biased and say it's great. But with all those things, I mean, all the, the Twitter, the Facebook, and the other things I do, it's all been called cultural journalism. And it's, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the cultural side and then the journalism side and offer you what I think are some, some guidelines to things that have worked for me. Um, they're not all things you need to do, but some of them have worked extremely well. Um, as you know, both my parents were poets. I, my father is also one of the country's great playwrights, and I can say this because, I mean, I believe it, but other people have said it as well. Uh, I noticed there hasn't been as much written about my mother, Colleen Thibodeau, and that's part of the reason I think I started to call her London's top poet. Dad never minded being London's second best poet, after when I called mom London's best poet. But that was kind of a way of promoting her and showing my love and respect for her. And you heard me do that in there. But that's again, I mean, sure it's cutesy and it's folksy, but it's also what I believe. And I think it worked with people because they could see that that's the way I really felt, that when I said she was London's best poet, it wasn't just... PR stuff that I was saying, I felt that way about her things. And actually, I should mention Roy, of course, Peggy Rothy, who were, um, was, was probably the, produced the MA thesis on, uh, on my mom, that was still, I looked to for a way of understanding my mom's poetry, which I could appreciate as she read it. And you saw here how she'll stop and digress and add things. Well, that was different from what's on the printed page, but Peggy did a fabulous job with what was on the printed page and drawing that out and making it even accessible for people like me. One of the things I, I still try to use is something my father told me in terms of reviews. He, as a playwright, he occasionally got very negative reviews. This might surprise you, but he, I don't think that bothered him particularly. But he, he was discussing some of the negative reviews with Marshall McLuhan, when McLuhan was a professor of his in the 1950s in Toronto. And I, I think I've got this right, but McLuhan felt that the critic and the reviewer's job is to show what kind of enjoyment you can derive from a, a work of art, a performance, um, it's not so important as whether you liked it or didn't like it, or whether you even understood it, but what kind of enjoyment there is to be derived from this. That's still what I try to do at the Free Press. I try, even if it's not my thing, I try to see it. What is the audience taking out of this concert? It doesn't work all the time. Um, it's never worked for Motley Crue. Frankly, I know their fans are passionate. If you're a Motley Crue fan, my apologies. Never been able to... <laughs> That's the other part of this is if something you don't get and you feel is... Well, uh, my Motley Crue stuff's on record, but, uh, but uh, 
Any year they play London, it's guaranteed to be the worst concert of the year. I can tell you that. From I, I've tried, I haven't made a minor effort, but I've decided it wasn't worth it. But you got to also say that too. If you really don't like something, make it clear that you know this is my opinion. It wasn't the audience disagreed. I was the only one there who didn't get it, but I didn't get it. I think you'd say that. Um, and that goes to one of the things. There are, there are two tips I can pass along that I think would help um, help almost anybody in any artistic reviewing pursuit and artistic. Uh, writing pursuit. What, do any of you ever have to negotiate deals with, if you're a freelancer or you have, are you started at the start of your career where you're talking to people about what you're going to get paid for something? Anybody, how, anybody, anybody had that experience? How do you handle it if I can ask somebody out there? Is anybody, go ahead. You start really, really high. You start really, really high. Good, okay. That's, anybody have any other strategies? Anybody else go here? Go. Hope for the best. Hope for the best. That's, that's, that does work. Sometimes the best. I'll tell you how I think one of the, the best might happen. If you, just, if you can control yourself and just shut up and make them name a figure first. I can't guarantee that will be the one you want. But the chances are it will be much higher <laughs> than you ever dared you know, think of realistically asking. And I know this from experience. It was a big corporation in town. Um, I was a relatively inexperienced freelance writer, but they, they needed somebody, and they probably were actually they probably were not going to dicker too hard. But I was going in, and I, I was about to say, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the figure I was, and across the table came, James, I don't think we can pay you more than $30 an hour. Now, this was back in 1984, when $30 an hour was $30 an hour. So I said, oh, oh, okay, I, I think, yeah, I I, I don't like my shock was real because I'd just been about to say, do you, you think $10 an hour would, would be too much? So I obviously wasn't following your strategy of going as high as I should have, but I guarantee you, and, and if it's an insulting figure, you probably, then you want to negotiate or maybe you want to walk away. If they think you're worth, you know, well, if they think you're worth Caterpillar money, you know, I don't think you want to, you may, you, it's not your choice, you may be able to, be able to bid them up, you may be able to argue with them, but, Get them to go first. Now the trouble is, of course, that the experienced negotiators in the arts, in business, everywhere, they know this rule and they will hold off as long as they can. But if you just hem and haw, you'll be surprised. I think that'll work for you and it should work in the clubs, it should work um, with freelance assignments and just, just negotiating. Let them name that dollar figure in the terms first and see where it goes. It worked for me and I, um, I can say if it, had, if it had been $10, they probably would have thought, ah, and maybe not hired me, because they would have realized how inexperienced I was. The other one, I, I, I've sort of alluded to this, I think is an important rule, is if, do say what you believe. Um, there's no, I probably tend to be more generous um, in, in trying to understand what a performance, or what a work of art is about than some other people. I'm not big on the fake, I didn't get it, it's you know, elitist, or it's this, or it's that. Um, if it offends me, I'll say so, and I'll give an example of, of something that, and it, because of the kind of writing I do otherwise, it's much more effective when I do this. I, is anyone familiar with recently the song, that is not really London's official song, but it was much promoted and talked about at the mayor's, the mayor's breakfast. Um, I, I saw there was a lot of controversy about that, and I, um, what basically seems to have happened is I think it was going to be part of the mayor's breakfast. Um, for whatever reason, he the tourism department ended up paying for it, and it was a piece by Jim Chapman. I was a, a long, I mean, Jim Chapman is, was an excellent bass player when I used to watch him with, I think, the Bluesman Review in high school back in the 60s. So Jim's, Jim has some credentials, but I frankly didn't think the song was, was anything we should be proud of in London, let alone worth the $1,800 that was spent on it. So I said so pretty bluntly. Um, I had some, the, the counter arguments were things like, well, it's a lot cheaper than it would be other places. Jim Chapman's a really good guy, he's done all kinds of good things for London. Um, one of the other arguments was, I didn't really commission that song, I just helped the mayor make it part of the breakfast. Um, Jim Chapman's group is called the Incontinentals, which I just thought was embarrassing, period. I mean, if you're trying to promote the city, I don't think you want to... And now, singing all about London, Ontario, the Incontinentals. So, that, so I said all these things, and I had a really, you know, I probably had a stronger response than um, 
because I think I, I said what a lot of people were thinking and probably saying in tweets and on Facebook and things like that, but there was an official column in the free press. Um, I, I did believe it. I wasn't making it, you know, I wasn't saying, boy, here's a chance to jump in and be controversial. I just felt somebody should say this. And the other thing I wanted to say is if you do want to spend $1,800 on a song about London, I mean, you could go out, you, well, probably in this room we could find someone who could do a better song. I would hope, I would hope someone in this room could do a better song. And I'm not saying that because Jim Chapman has done only bad songs. He hasn't, but this one was not, this was not a good song. Um, we could probably have a more, more fun with it. It'd be hipper, it'd be, you know, it'd just be something that would actually tell you what the city was about than this kind of jingly thing we got stuck with. So don't hesitate to speak your mind um, succinctly, be funny about it. And I, th I think as, I don't think I was, um, I think I was more funny, but necessarily the people I was making fun of didn't see it that way. They, they felt I was being a little harsh, but we talked about it. And in one case, and I think we came away, we had to agree to disagree. So those two things, let them name the dollar figure first and speak your mind. In no particular order, and this I've, uh, I think local cultural journalists need to get out there and enjoy what your fellow city citizens are creating. I try to do that through volunteerism. I'm a member of the Jack Richardson Music Awards Steering Committee, and I should say, if I can introduce in the audience our chair, beloved chair for life, John B. Young. I think, I, please give a round of applause for John B. Yeah. You know, I started out really getting involved in this just because I was intrigued. How much great music in different genres and different areas was there in London? I knew something about that because of the things I covered for the free press, but I think John and I would agree. We met performers through the Jacks that we had, we had no idea. They weren't on our radar at all. And we like, you know, we like to think we're, we're out there trying to listen to stuff and experience stuff, but we've met some people in all kinds of, all kinds of fields. We've had, performing in our gala, we've had Clark Bryan, who is the owner and really the, the head honcho at Aeolian Hall playing beautiful classical piano. We've had the Trolls, who are uh, probably the best, the best band that never really got it together enough to, to do it, but the Trolls are just a fantastic, that's T-O-R-L-E-S, if you ever get a chance to see it, it is a fantastic show. We've had people you probably know like Shelley Raston and Denise Pelly. Um, we've had punk bands, we've had hip hop, we had, we had Shad performing um, before he was Shad, if I can say that, before his, his big hits had arrived and before he won a Juno. But we know there's great music out there. Last year at the Junos, there were four London identified acts that won Junos. We won in classical music with Larry St. John. We won hip hop, which, you know, the Shad winning the rap recording proves to me that if he can beat Drake, the Junos are not a fake industry thing. I mean, he beat the host. So people listened to Shad, listened to Drake, and said, Shad is the one who gets it. Um, Caribou, and I agree the guy in Caribou, Dan Snaith, only lived here for about the first 12 years of his life and he's been elsewhere, but the, the touring version of the band has at least two guys from Fanshawe MIA in it, so they're, they're pretty London. And uh, then the, who just, she just played here with, or, with on an orchestra London gig, um, Megan Smith, who went uh, to Beale Art. She's a tremendous visual artist. If you ever get a chance, she's got incredible stage presence, and she also has these great songs that she, and sings, and she covered she covered Moon River as her encore. She can, there's a name, she wanted the best new artist, you know. So there's four from our, sort of our world. All of them, have, they're legitimate London artists. Well, that tells me how rich and diverse we have. I found out part of that through just getting out and being part of the Jacks. I should mention the Jack Richardson Music Awards, and if you'd like to talk to me or talk to John about them, if you're interested, we'd love to hear from you. But they're London's only not-for-profit celebration of our musical excellence. And we do two things that we're really proud of on the at the Jacks. I think John would back me up on this. The two things are, well, John, do you want to start? Okay, you'll defer to me. We pay our performers and our big events, the gala and the education sessions, and the education sessions are fantastic. I mean, they're like an MIA level seminar, but in a very, in a non-classroom way, they're free. So we think we've really, we found a way to try to encourage everybody to give something, but also recognize the performers are professionals. The other thing I've learned, and despite how sure or unsure I sound up here, is um, don't be too sure you're right if you dismiss something. Um, this is with Bernie, as Bernie would know about this, but I think Bernie might agree that many of the, because of your, uh, Bernie is a fine percussionist, but also has, has studied and celebrated jazz drumming on DVDs and elsewhere. But I think it's true to say that many of the great drummers in jazz history, the first years of their, where they were too loud, 
They were too sloppy. They couldn't keep the beat. They weren't listening. Well, then after, it soon became apparent that after about 10 years, so-and-so was, the, you know, whether it was S.A. Elvin Jones or Max Roach. They were fired from all their first jobs because they didn't play the way the bands wanted them to play. And then, but it, once they, you know, once they found where they should be, but once the critics and the audience caught up with them, suddenly they were the great jazz percussionists. Well, that, that tells you that we critics don't really, you know, we don't get it right all the time. We get it wrong a lot of the time. One of the things that drives me crazy, and we do it every week in the free press, is which movie made the most money on the, you know, there's a list in there. And they'll say movies are flops. You know, if they don't, if they don't, they didn't live up to expectations. Well, what they mean is it didn't make as much money as it was supposed to. But it sure doesn't mean it was a bad movie compared with the crap movie that, you know, made $35 million or $75 million that week. The best movies that play, play the Highland Cinema. And they are not the ones, in most parts, that are the big dollar ones. But if you want a great movie experience, go out to the Highland Cinema. Big screen, great place, good movies. They're just not the ones. And that, I, I've never felt comfortable with that, saying, if something is like the Beatles, and is a huge popular success, and a critical success, and it stands the test of time as an artistic achievement, great. But in many cases, the dollar value thing is, is completely misleading. And actually, I spoke to a session like this at Western once, and that was... That was big controversial moment because it turns out that was sort of the key element of their every class each week was trying to predict which movie would make the most money and then feeling really good. I said, well, you know, I well, think you're sort of going about this the wrong way. But that part, that, that was still a work in progress in convincing them to do that. Because I spent a lot of time in really most of my adult life in, here in London, first when I was growing up in the 1960s and then after I came back from our world tour with my wife Susan Wallace, I was in the front row, um, in the 1970s. I think find out what the local tradition are. It's, it's, it, I assume some people are, who's from, who's from far away from London? And then, you know, list of all doesn't count. Go ahead. Go here. Where are you from? Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia? What's the, what's the big, what's the big tradition where you're from? Well, what, what, what if people think of the place? What are they connected with? Is that pizza? Pizza? What's? No. <laughs> pizza? Well, that's good. Nova Scotia. What about what do people connect? Uh, like the shalings and shit background, like the model background. Yeah. Do you, and do you find that some of that the the blue nose, like we call it the blue nose kind of thing? Whatever, do you think that the you know the, the filmmakers and the trailer park and trailer park boys and all the other stuff, the rock fans in Nova Scotia, are they any connected with that in any way? Or are they? Yeah, I definitely. Okay, that's. Yeah. That was, see, that's intriguing. Is obviously the things that we associate with Nova Scotia, the people who are doing the thing right now, whether it's Trailer Park Boys or the best rock bands around or some of the films that are going on there, they still see themselves as part of that. And that's what I've tried to connect with. I've been lucky enough to be around some of the people through my parents, and starting with my parents, but with what I think the tradition is here in London. I think one thing, you, and having said that, I also think you should try and invent your own tradition. Um, it's actually it's a good example. There's one person I've been writing about for about most of my free press entertainment career is a guy called Garth Hudson. Does anyone know who Garth Hudson is? Okay. Roy, who's Garth Hudson? Well, he was the, uh, keyboard player for the band. He was the keyboard player for the band. Um, does that mean anything to anybody? Is that well, Garth? You know, it used to be if you drove on Epworth Avenue. Um, which is a beautiful little street in Old North London in Brookdale. Garth Hudson would be honking away on the saxophone on his parents' porch. This is probably, we're probably talking almost 50 years ago before he went away with Rob and Ronnie. I've been trying to write about, you know, convince the city to do something for Garth Hudson. He's going to be 75 this year. I don't think you can get a bigger clue than that. He was born in Windsor, but he grew up in London Township in London. He then went on, he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's done all kinds of things. Um, still alive, still playing beautifully. Well, today, they're the film of the farewell concert of the band, The Last Waltz, is going to be at the Highland next Friday night, the 24th. And if you're a fan of music at all, I would urge you to go. Know, it's apparently a fabulous print. The sound is incredible. I've been watching my, uh, a tape I have of it, and it's a great, you know, Neil Diamond's in it, sure, but so is Neil Young. I mean, Joni Mitchell's in it, Muddy Waters is in it, Eric Clapp is in it, and the band is, it's a fascinating movie about, about music and, and friendship and, and the business. Great performances. Well, anyway, there was supposed to be a story about that. I think with the drum and cuts, 
took over most of the free press today, so my little Garth Hudson story <laughs> didn't make it yet. So I'll have to go back to the office and see what happens. I can also tell you that um, I took a call from a journalist in New York who was in the early days of Kitty, who were still around. They're playing back in their hometown. They don't, Kitty doesn't play London a lot. Really successful metal band. And they're in the London Music Hall of Fame through the Jack Richardson Music Awards. But earlier on, say about 10 years ago, a journalist from New York called. And who was the one musician you, you think he connected with London, Ontario? It's, I, there's no points, but this is an easy one. Guy Lombardo. So of course, partway through, he and I started to have one of those who's on first conversations where I said, Garth Hudson, and I think he heard it as Garth Richardson, who worked on the first Kitty record, and it was Jack Richardson's son. Or maybe I said Garth Richardson, and he heard it as Garth Hudson. But I said, you know, sort of like, what group's he in? The band. No, no, what band? No, he's in the band. He plays keep. No, what band? So after it took a long time, eventually he sorted it out. But I thought, i got to work a little harder on promoting Garth Hudson in London, because clearly the message is not getting out there, how great he is. Another one I like to do, and I, I think I would say read the local poets to look at the local painters, but read the local novels. There are places in Canada like Kingston which have dozens of novels. Maybe it's the jail, but I don't think it's just the jail. But there are lots of novels set in Kingston. There aren't that many, believe me, because I've, I've looked, that are set in what you would say was really London, Ontario. Maybe some of you out there are writing London, Ontario novels or poems or epics, but please let me know. I'd like to find out more. Um, one of the interesting things I found out in my research, um, does anyone know the Lou Archer series of detective novels? Mm -hmm. that, what, where do you think, where did Ross McDonald go to university? Who wrote them? He wrote them, uh, his name was Kenneth Miller, but where did, yeah. he went to Western. Which you would never, I mean, you never gather that because everyone thinks of him as an American, but he, and if you look around in the equivalent, sort of the, the interrobang equivalent of Western student newspapers in the 30s and their literary publications, there are Kenneth Miller poems in there, which are very much in mood like the Ross MacDonald novels. The Lou Archer novels are famous because it supposedly, they supposedly married Freud with the American, you know, the Maltese Falcon and Sam Spade and those kind of American detective thrillers. But there's a very dark, deep undercurrent. To them. Well, that was all partly, supposedly one of his books was written about London Ontario. Can't prove that, but he was here as part of our tradition. Um, there's a great book about teaching high school called Wind Without Rain that came out in the 1940s. Uh, it's by Selwyn Dudney. Selwyn Dudney was a remarkable visual artist. Actually, one of the things some of us are concerned about, aside from the horrors of it and the unfairness of the Caterpillar situation, but if you could get inside the lobby of the EMD building, there are these amazing Selwyn Dudney murals from about 19, the early 50s. Um, they're very similar to the ones that are in the old, they're now in the public, the Ed Center Auditorium. He did those for when it, back when I was back in high school, but he did this, and it, it's, about, it's about really about the, the problems of trying to teach high school if you're a creative, soulful person, and the, the system, it, you would almost believe it's contemporary. Sure, the language is a little dated, or you might say, well, that wouldn't really happen now, but the hero and the hero's friends confront the, the evil administrator and, uh, and lose. I mean, it's not... You know, somebody, it's, it's not a happy story. It's a tough story. But there, if you get a chance, Wind Without Rain by Selwyn Dudney. Um, Five Legs by Graham Gibson. And some of you, Graham Gibson has a tie with Margaret Atwood. This is, this is a long time, a long time companion, husband, spouse, whatever the correct phrase is. But if you read Five Legs, that's about London in the 1950s. And it's about sort of the bohemian hipster theater scene in London in the 50s. Apparently, there are some of the people who are still around who were, Graham Gibson wasn't particularly kind to, but for a long time that was a standing joke that everybody who was hip in London said, ah, Graham Gibson's novel in progress, it'll never happen. Well, it, it came out in 1969 finally, and he's still, still writing, still doing all sorts of great things. Like, that's a story I've still got to, I'd like to nail down. Um, we had a Giller Prize winner, A Good House by Bonnie Bernard, very good. And, you know, there are, and her book is, London is definitely in that book. A lot of it is, I think, Bonnie Bernard seems very sensitive about this part of it, but she grew up in Forest, I think, which is over in, near Grand Bend in Lambton. But some of the book is there, but a lot of it's right in London, Ontario. And uh, it, it's a, just a great read and very enjoyable. Um, another thing I, 
I think, and I'd look for your help on this, what, what's a genuine world-beating artistic accomplishment from London, Ontario? Any, anybody got any suggestions? That, I've talked about some of the ones that I like, but any, any that you know of in, in music, film, dance, um, literature, visual arts? Any, any suggestions? I'd say the film Crash. The film Crash? But of course, what, talk a little bit about why it's a London. He co-wrote it. It's Paul Haggis. I think he and he he was a student here. Was he a student yeah. here? And I think in mm -hmm. fine art. In fine art. Um, that's that's sort of one of the famous accomplishments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any anybody else who got crashed? That's pretty. No, it's not bad. Winning the Oscar. That's pretty good. That's fantastic. Best picture. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anyone got crashed? I, I'll mention one. That it's a completely different kind of movie called The Heart of London. It was made by. One of our great visual artists, Jack Chambers. There's a terrific Jack Chambers exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario, which is well, if you get down there, you'll see places in London you recognize, particularly around the Chamber family house in uh, Lombardo. There it is again, Lombardo Avenue in Old North. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's an experimental art film, so there are all kinds of images, and he, I think he pirated things and just cleaned out the old CFPL TV archives and put them together, but it's a fantastic experiences in movie day. One of the things I was lucky enough to hear is Stan Brackage, who was a great experimental filmmaker in the US, he said this was one of the five best movies ever made, which is sort of in the experimental film world, that's your Oscar right there. Stan Brackage, who's kind of the god of this particular genre, says that's one of the best. What he explained, he helped me understand it because I thought, you know, there's signs of being, you know, you can sense there's this tension between the natural world, the deer and things like that you see being slaughtered on location, and it's all, a lot of it's real footage, I mean, it's just things that, you know, from a deer hunt, from a, a deer that got loose in London and the police eventually had to kill, those kind of things. And there'd be shots, you know, you feel this tension of what's going on with this. There's also shots of people, you know, cutting lawns and things like that, looking very smug. And Stan Brackage's interpretation, and this really helped me see how great The Heart of London is, was that that's a view, it's, it's partly about the way we murder nature, whether it's a deer loose in the city or cutting our front lawn. He said, think of cutting your front lawn as five million little murders. I remember for the first time, it starts out, that's, because there are some famous Jack Chambers paintings, too, of him out cutting his lawn and things like that. And I thought, finally I understood that. And that took somebody, an expert from outside, to help me. But that's a genuine world beating accomplishment, I think. The flip side of this is it's is that some of the genuinely great people in the world are not going to stop in London, Ontario. They they don't know where it is and they, they don't really care. Um, I don't know if you've it's probably revealing my sort of my biases, but a, there's a band called Sonic Youth, which is never which is a, in a certain genre is probably the best kind of art rock band there is. Really good. Now they will probably never never play London, but does anyone know what would Sonic Youth's connection and a couple of people from Sonic Youth have certainly played here. Does anyone know what their tie to London is? If I say the Nihilist Spasm Band, is that right? Well, that's, uh, well they're, they're friends of Sonic Youth, hard as that is. The Nihilist Spasm Band are a group of artists and friends who started out and just made noise music in the 1960s. And they've been playing, I think, every Monday night. They, that's their fiction. They're, so they had to take some off. But basically, if you go over to the Fourth City Gallery on Monday night, you would probably, if you can get in there, hear them making their noise music. They claim they're rehearsing, but they really, they don't have to rehearse. They've, they pinked a long time ago. But, but you also hear them talk about their mortgages. Um, uh, they're they're grown-up kids. In some cases, they're grandkids. Great guys. They, well, they're stars in Japan, in Germany, and yet they're just, you know, everyday people. Well, among their very influential friends are people like Thurston Moore and Lee Ronaldo, the guitar players in Sonic Youth. And, Lee Ronaldo, and this again relates to what I was saying about Stan Brackett and Jack Chambers. Lee Ronaldo said Murray Favreau is a wonderful, terrific visual artist, but is one of the five best guitarists, or he's the best guitarist I've ever heard. And Murray is not predominantly a guitarist, but whatever Thurston Moore takes out of what Murray does with the spasm man, he obviously hears things that many of us, it sounds like noise, it is noise, but to Thurston Moore it's something artistic and shaped, and he wants to hear it again and again. So. That tells me, I mean, the world beaters may not get here, Sonic Youth may not get here, but the people in Sonic Youth know what's going on and they're worth heeding when they do. 
One thing I try to do as well is make a lot of lists, and even of things I like, and maybe sometimes things I don't like, but more things I like, because that's, I think, more, more, I find it, to me it's better to tell people what's good about something than what's bad about it. Unless, if you feel it's, you can offer constructive criticism, hey, have you thought of this? You know, have you maybe stopped, you know, maybe if you drop the sexism from the lyrics, the music will come through a little better, something like that. But I started to um, do, probably about 10, 12 years ago, I, I noticed no one had really done a top 10 of London albums by London artists. There were, you know, people would have, the best album of the year was by Radiohead, and here's my list of the other records I liked. Well, everyone could do that. But I thought, there's probably 10 good records in London I could make, and of course it turned out there were way more than 10. I mean, as we found out with the Jack Richardson Music Awards, it's not, I mean, it's not as if you have to stop at 10 in a particular category, you can go way beyond that. So I started to do that, and eventually, uh, by coincidence, um, CHRW has picked up on it, and they actually have, they are much better at it than I am, because they have a critics pool and a bunch of people participating, sending, you know, their choices for London's albums. But they actually give them some real money, some studio time and some real money, and help them out. But that shows that, you know, if you start doing these things, somebody else will pick up on it, and uh, it'll come along. Um, even, I, one of my other rules is even if you're not judgmental, don't hesitate to you know, get a chance to be a judge. If somebody asks you to um, take part in judging a film contest, um, I've, I've, I've judged film contests um, uh, where somebody had spent $1,500 on his movie and boy was he mad when he didn't win. I mean, that was sort of, he was right in our face. So I've also judged, um, well they were spice, a little Spice Girl contest. That, that the London Public Library had back when the Spice Girls were, were when, in their pre-grandmother phase. And uh, when they were there, but uh, you know, I was amazed these, because obviously the Spice Girls, whatever they were to me, to these girls, they were, and they were, there weren't too many young women, let's say girls, but girls 14 and under, the Spice Girls were something they'd never really experienced before. They were a way into be glamorous pop music. And there was a friend of ours actually who was ginger, one of the rare ginger spices was, and she was probably the best, she was better than Ginger Spice, I think. But it was just this fabulous experience. I would never, if I'd said no, it's kind of beneath me to judge a Spice Girls contest at the London Public Library. Which part of it, a little boy said, ugh. But I went out and I had a great time. So, you know, open yourself up to those things and you'll be really surprised. And that goes back, of course, to the getting involved in the community that I talked about. My tenth one is, uh, this is a pretty obvious one here, don't forget the uh, community college university in your midst. And I probably, um, I'm probably not surprising anyone here, but if I say that um, almost every, almost all, almost all the Juno, significant Juno nominations have some kind of tie to Fanshawe, particularly in the engineering. And the, well, the production award is named, the producer of the year award is named for Jack Richardson. But there's some kind of tie in Canadian music to Fanshawe's MIA program. And that'd be true of almost, if there's a good album in London, it has some kind of Fanshawe tie as well. I hope, I hope you feel part of that. I want to say one of my regrets will always be that, um, because of the aftermath of my mom's death, I didn't get a chance to go up, but I, was anybody at the uh, Jack Richardson event that, um, at, uh, I didn't, anybody else here, were the Fanshawe MIA students to, the, the Jack Richardson songs at Aeolian Hall. You know, I thought, I, I knew how good that was, you know, it just sounded so exciting, I couldn't get it together to, to go. But one of the neat things, I think, is that, what was, what was the big statement there? It was the Fanshawe students went off campus. You know, they went to Aeolian Hall. I think partly because they knew, you know, the acoustics there are great, it's got a great vibe, it's a, just a good place to have that kind of thing. But they made a statement that this is big enough, we, we're confident we can share this with the rest of, you know, the 360,000 other Londoners. I hear it was great, and I, I will regret missing it, or, but that's the kind of thing, don't hesitate to do that with your stuff. Take it to the people. I mean, it's great to be a garage band, it's great to be, you know, working with your laptop in your basement, but get out there and, uh, and take what you're learning at Fanshawe, those of you who are students here, and try and, you know, get it out to the rest of us in London, because there is a, there's a potentially big audience for you there, a knowledgeable audience, and I think people will find people who will Love you right back. And I, in looking over my list, um, I see we've gone the top ten list of James Rainey cultural tips. We've got everything from get out in the community, to make lists, to pay attention to the places like Fanshawe that encourage our creative city. 
And that's one that, of course, I said you all know. And I think if I look over the list of what I've been trying to talk about today, I think my underlying desire, I realize, is probably to make connections. I talked about the connections between Sonic Youth and Niles Spasm Man, between my parents. Margaret Avison, for instance, who was mentioned as the first was a great friend of my parents, a, a real inspiration and friend to my mother, and someone she corresponded with um, throughout, throughout her life. Um, to introduce new experiences, that you know, get out of your comfort zone once in a while. You know you're good at something, but try something completely different. Or try collaborating with somebody you don't know and see how that goes. Um, to, so, to celebrate old forms. I mean, I, when I talk about the novel, I mean, I don't know. Some people may say, well, the novel has been dead for so long, why are we? But I bet people are reading, they may not be reading a book like this, but boy, they're reading more and more and more in new forms and through the new media all the time. And then just work with yourself and your friends and, and those you love and to try and pull together the, the seemingly separate forces of culture and journalism into what I call cultural journalism. Thanks very much. We have a few minutes yeah. for questions from your audience. I'd be delighted. I, if you have questions, I might have an answer. I, maybe not quite, but... John, John B. Maybe you could share your experience of sitting, you talked about being on panels and working with, with people, is on the Polaris. Well, that's one of the things I did. I was um, a member of the Polaris uh, Music Prize final jury. There were, about, there were 11 or 12 people from across Canada who, and we were, we were picking what they say is the best Canadian album. That's, it's a little misleading because it's probably, you know, the best Canadian, Shad was on that list, Bash and Blue was on that list, Caribou was on that list. So there were three from London, so I, but it, you know, the, the people who were, and they really knew their stuff. I mean, I was, I was, but they, you know, they were. We shared each other. We we discussed, and then at the end, um, it was quite exciting because uh, the Caribou record was the one we chose. Now that was, believe me, we didn't go in. A group was saying, "Boy, the Caribou record is the best." It's Caribou's Andorra, which is a really, if you haven't heard it, and you think you don't like electronica, um, give it a try. It's melodic. It's it has you know, it'd be terrific. It's terrific dance music. It's terrific art music. But that was the one we picked, and I came away thinking. Because I've been on real life juries too, where you're trying to determine someone's guilt or innocence. And the experience was kind of the same. I felt just in the juries I've been on, I felt it came away feeling, yeah, the Canadian justice system worked. Um, we didn't come into the room agreeing, we didn't come in saying, there's the bad person, there's the good person, or this is what we believe. But we talked and talked and shared, and we eventually came up with, I think, the right decision. And that's what I feel happened in the Polaris case. Um, <laughs> Daryl Sturden, who's uh, he's our top writer with the Quebec Corps uh, QMI agency, he wrote for writes for the Winnipeg Sun. And I was I'd sort of forgotten the Caribou from for London. I've been talking about Shad and Bash and how great they were, but I said, well, by the way, Daryl, you know where you know Dan Snaith was born at St. Joseph's Hospital. He grew up on St. James Street, and he went to St. George George's Public School on Waterloo Street. I said, James, for you, it's always London. Is it's always London. I said, I can't help it. You know, look at you know, Caribou, number one. And he was kidding me, but that was but that was the experience. And I didn't go in there saying, I'm gonna vote strategically so that Caribou ends up where it was, you know, where it was. I um, I did, you know, I and, and we agreed to keep our discussions confidential, but I could say honestly that they were all serious. You know, nobody got on somebody's face and said, you don't know what you're talking about, but we sure pushed each other to come with the best decision. And that year, I think we, you know, we sure did. So yeah, it was a, as an experience, it's like being on a jury. You take it seriously and you listen to what your, um, your colleagues are saying. So it was, yeah, it's one of the things I'll take away for a long time. I really feel quite proud of being a small part of that. I have a couple questions. Oh. Um, one is I'd like to ask you a little bit your childhood, your early life, with your parents. You have two siblings, is that right? Well, well, um, I had, there, were, there were three of us. My brother John Andrew died in 1966, and I should, um, that was, a, you know, that was a devastating event for my parents, and I realized, that, of course, it's only as an adult we see how, how strong that was. But our childhood, we were, um, well, that, one of the amazing things, Susan and I are, of course, now we're starting to find my mom's correspondence and letters she wrote to her girlfriends, to um, other poets. So, you know, it's funny to see, because, like, you know, I'm in there. I just, 
this little red-haired guy, and, you know, and now he's walking, and now he's sort of, here's a, a list of his first words that my, you know, my dad would record and things like that. So um, I think I was too little to really appreciate what was happening, you know, around me, but, but at the same time I like to feel that, I mean, I was lucky enough to be, um, because, I, you know, I, I met people like Margaret Atwood when I, because they were friends of my parents when I was in high school, so Therefore, I wasn't particularly intimidated by fa famous people, which I was trying to be a baseball reporter. It was quite useful because one of my favorite moments in covering baseball, I don't, does anybody remember Billy Martin? Mm -hmm. he, used, he used to manage the Yankees, and he was a, now there was a tough guy. 1985, the Jays are playing the Yankees, and eventually the Jays are going to win, but I asked him, it was a private moment, he was off in his office or something like that. I, it was, Marilyn Bell was a cross like swimmer, it's a huge deal. Well, this was the biggest thing I thought since Marilyn Bell landed safely in Toronto River. So, Billy Martin, do you think this is the most historic moment in Canadian sports since Marilyn? And he's like, I don't give a shit about history. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay, we can't quote that, can we, Mr. Martin? <laughs> we'll have to tone it down for the day in the paper. Of course, you see now, of course, you just have the mic there, and boy, you'd have it out on, you know, it'd be all over Twitter in about three seconds. But, but yeah, th th I think that's what I take away is that I had a chance to, to meet some, some great people um, and, and as I pre became to see my parents in a different, you know, different light to understand that. So I think I was, and I was certainly, they, my parents were very supportive of whatever I was trying to do. And my, um, my sister was a, she went to Beale and she was a visual artist and I encouraged that as well. So my la I think my last question to you would be about how do you manage your time? Because you do the rainy picks, you do a blog, you do Twitter, you have to write for the free press, you have deadlines. I mean, yeah. how, how many articles do they expect from you in a week? Oh, <laughs> do you do a daily thing? That, well, yeah, I try and write something. I mean, I don't, don't always do this, but there's, it's a very sensitive issue because I won't say which. Anyway, there was a time when the bylines began to get... Our, there was this nice the quiet count bylines, you know, the by James Rains. Well, Fortunately, um, I, I try to do enough, and I think I don't think it really came to me. But, but my point was, it's very hard to judge our productivity that way um, because some things are this long, but they took you two weeks to get the person to say this, you know, the key things here. Um, but yeah, I I don't know how well I really manage my time. I think we're all probably headed into a world where your employer sort of you're sort of tied to your employer and your job and everything twenty four seven. If you you know, I saw something, why not tweet about it? You know, and then why not put it on the blog, or why not send a story in for our website? Um, I do my best, and if anyone has, if you have a magic, some magic suggestions for how to time manage better, but you are expected, I found, to completely multitask. That I may be thinking about the column I want to write. Susan and I are going to go and see the Great Gatsby tonight. It's a preview, but we'll write. I'll, I'll write the review for Saturday's paper at the uh, what's on at the Grand. Um, it's, I haven't done theater in a long time, so that'll be a uh, return to you know, to step it up there, but I, I don't think there's any easy way. Otherwise, just to you know, also take some time away, do some things that aren't you know, because the, the employers love you, they'd love you to work 24/7. I mean, and, and donate a lot of your time. I always try and tell people, don't donate your time to the employer. And yet, I'm as bad at it as anybody else. Um, but make sure there's a lot of time for you and those you love, because the. More and more with the technology now, you can. I mean, you can be contributing to the lfpress.com, to our website, theoretically any time of the day. Just saw a car crash on our street. Here's a picture of it I took with my Blackberry. Here's a tweet about it. Here's, you know, I found out who was involved. Well, that's, that's a little demanding, I think. I've got to step, keep stepping back from that. So if you, maybe if there are suggestions, I would welcome them. One more question. I wanted to ask, uh, do you think the London art scene has expanded over the years? And, uh, um, just in case, do I think the London art scene has expanded over the years, and what do I think has changed about it? Um, I'm a little biased because I grew up in the 1960s when there were Jack Chambers, Bernice Vincent, Greg Colonel, Marie Favreau, Ron Martin, Tony Urquhart. There, I mean, there were the. It was it was fair to say that London was the center of not just you know the Canadian art scene, but in some ways, I mean, North America and the world was looking to London. So I'm a little biased on the if you mean visual arts, I'm a little biased there. One point, though, that people make is that you got to look back. I mean, they didn't come out of nowhere. The Selman Dudneys were there to teach them. The Herb Arises, the whole tradition at Beale, and uh, was there. You know, they were. They had come from somewhere. So there was a, 
way back in the, you know, there were, there were hipsters and bohemians and artists way back that we don't really know much about. Um, so that, that even that great scene came out. I think that's, what I'd say is that, um, the, the, one of the, what I've taken away is that we may not hit those particular heights again, but there's, it's so much more diverse. I mean, London is a complete, it was a very white city when I, when I was going to high school. Um, there were very few other cultures represented, um, very few other, you know, um, other, other people from anywhere else. It was predominantly, that's, you know, people have been here for a long time and that was it. So the city is much richer and more diverse. I'd say one of the things, London is so big now, if, if this is my, well, I'll use this as an example of how I think it's changed. Does the name John Aquaviva mean anything to anybody? I know it does to, I think to, <laughs> John, Aquavelva I think is our, but John Aquaviva, if, you, is, if you're in a club in Barcelona or Tokyo, it's a good chance that the DJ there is John Aquaviva. He's famous around the world. He lives, I'll say, he lives somewhere in London, I won't blow his cover, but he lives somewhere in London. Um, but he's happy, he's a world superstar in his electronic uh, dance music genre. But he can live anonymously in London, Ontario. He doesn't have to play, he doesn't play London very often for a whole bunch of reasons. Very successful other ends, but I think that's it. The city's now so big, you can be a success story elsewhere and still have a base in London. And we, you know, we the free press, I get in touch with John as much as I can, but do I make enough of what he does? No. And uh, that's probably the big change, whereas I don't think there were, it was, if you were talented, you probably, your, your light wasn't going to be, you know, you weren't going to be anonymous in London. Um, I think that's probably one of the changes. And then the huge number of people who are involved now. I mean, there were no rock bands doing original songs, or very few when I was a kid in the 60s. I mean, that was, you know, they were cover bands, they were very good at it, but, you know, maybe one original song and I, well, now there are all kinds of great acts who do nothing but their own material. If they do a cover, it's because they want to make a point that we really liked Big Star, or we really liked, you know, Alex Chilton or something like that, or we want to have some fun doing some Black Sabbath, you know, stuff like that. I hope that helps, that's a little bit of my feel anyway. One more question, but we're, maybe you can come, come now some after, because we have yeah. to. We have to stop. I want to thank you. Oh, so thank much you. For Fantastic. Here. Thank you, and thanks to Susan too for coming. I know. We have uh, we have an exciting new guest coming in um, March, March fifteenth. So we hope that you come back, Terry Griggs. She's a mystery writer, crime writer, and a YNA writer from Stratford, Ontario. So also from our local region. She'll be here March fifteenth, two o'clock, here on DJ Sixty. Thanks. And I, if I just mentioned, Terry Griggs would be one of the people who went to Western. She was studying with my dad, a great friend of my mom's, uh, just a terrific writer, and uh, has been a successful at all kinds of things. So she's great. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah.